morning and welcome back to the lecture series on partition of India in print media and cinema. Today we are going to talk about the second and third generation uh, immigrants uh, in the diaspora. So, we have to understand uh, what comprises the different generations first. The first generation when we talk about the first generation migrants, we are talking about the adults at the time of partition, the ones that either moved uh, sing, uh, as single men and women with their natal families, their extended families or in the case of the women that were recently married, they moved with their new families. By second generation, we refer to uh, a populace that were either born before or uh, after partition, after their parents uh, came as refugees or immigrants to India. So, they were either uh, children at the time of partition, uh, something between somewhere between uh, somewhere below the age of 15 or they were born in independent India. And these children had a wide range of experiences while uh, their parents uh, were struggling to establish themselves in the host land. And the third uh, generation refers to those that were born to the children of uh, the first generation refugees. Uh, so, the first generation are their grandparents. right? these three generations also have very different understandings of partition. Uh, the time period that has elapsed becomes very important and so the family narratives, the story of the original home on the other side of the border uh, become uh, diluted uh, with the progression of time. The narratives are disjointed and the way of uh, looking at uh, the, the uh, watershed of partition becomes very different for the different generations. And there are certain gaps uh, which cannot be uh, you know overcome. So, memories are never straightforward and simplistic remembrances, but they are interspersed with uh, forgetting too. Uh, individuals uh, do not want to uh, remember and sometimes family do not want to recall or even tell the next generation about the bad times. So, how much is remembered and then how much is passed on to the next generation is something very interesting to note uh, or is something that one might want to study. Uh, and people often avoid the stigma of being the refugee, right? which is also why uh, the narratives become trimmed. The narratives ca can uh, either be trimmed or uh, blow out of proportion and acquire a grandeur or uh, acquire a, a grand uh, you know scale depending on what it is about. If it is a, 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 a story of a journey of progress and you know uh, ultimately success and ultimate uh, success, then it is actually uh, told with a lot of uh, pomp and uh, elan within the family. If it is a story of uh, failure of of desti uh, of of uh, desti uh, and a life of destitute, uh, then it is li uh, not likely to be narrated uh, uh, or or to be circulated too much uh, uh, within the family. So uh, so a lot of such those stories get sidelined to the point of being forgotten, right? The nation also has an amnesia. Nation wants to focus on the newly established independent nation, you know, in the newly established uh, notion of, uh, uh, of a free country, of, of uh, an independent nationhood, and it wants to build on that rather than, uh, you know, uh, uh, harping too much on the backlogs, on the setbacks of partition. The personal uh, fragmented narratives have uh, you know given each of the three generations uh, uh, distinct and yet overlapping views of partition around the dominant uh, issues. So, the dominant issues are uh, the dominant issues comprise the rhetoric of success, the temporary nature of uh, and even the anomalous nature of uh, the cataclysm and then uh, you know the pleasure of uh, you know narrating th about the shared culture, how the people struggle together, the refugees struggle together uh, shoulder to shoulder and uh, they overcame and how they uh, you know came over the, the crisis. 
So, the second and third generations relate to the success of their families uh, in two ways. On the one hand, uh, they uh, project back to the notion of pre partition success, and on the other, they uh, want to look forward, they, they want to embrace their family duties and uh, their own versions of a hard work ethic. So, this is uh, mainly uh, in, in, in relation to the Punjabi refugees I am talking about. So, the second and especially third generation emphasize the effect of partition on their families and uh, they recount the, uh, they, they therefore, inherit those narratives of, of uh, wealth and status that were once there and then they were lost when the family became refugees. And so, the, um, they, they have this imagination of the pre-partition lifestyle of their forefathers, uh, which they want to uh, you know regain, which they want to achieve again in the new land. So, uh, the, the discussion of the sizable, uh, sizable Haveli uh, and the large joint families with many servants and the amenities enjoyed and the status enjoyed by the family are um, you know part of uh, you know family legacies, family lores right. Second generations focus on maintaining their middle class identity and uh, they had uh, you know the knowledge that their family was not only many of them actually uh, boast of the fact that their families not only uh, possessed wealth. Uh, but also, uh, 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 you know, a commensurate status which needs to be, uh, you know, brought back, which needs to be regained. Uh, so, emphasis, emphasis is uh, among the refugees, um, there is a great emphasis on education, education as a means uh, or the social capital as a means of, I am sorry, the social and cultural capital as a means of, you know, um, gaining wealth, uh, gaining economic capital. And so, they attest to their, uh, the third and second generations attest to their potential, their capability of maintaining their uh, family's reputation uh, through not only, uh, you know, uh, and maintaining the family's reputation, uh, something that the family had achieved once by dint of their hard work and uh, the, the patriarch's uh, sacrifice most of the times, the sacrifice of the refugee generation. The second and the third generations uh, want to uh, maintain the family's reputation that was originally earned by dint of hard work and a sacrifice of the first generation refugees. So, uh, this success of the subsequent generations of refugees is a combination of understanding uh, the and, and uh, the knowledge of the what the family had previously the pre partition lifestyle and then the inspiration and the determination to work hard uh, as well as the family pressure that makes uh, the subsequent generations work hard uh, in order to achieve uh, you know gain back uh, such uh, gain back uh, th the past uh, you know reputation past status. Uh, and achieve material success and uh, stability. So, uh, the third generation's vision of past wealth is uh, a direct product of how the first generation narrates the past. So, the third generation learns about uh, the, the, the entire journey after partition through uh, the direct witnesses, the ones that had been there, that had lived through all of it. Uh, the hard working Punjabi refugee is not only a general you know not only a trope but it has become a larger stereotype uh, that in a way is forced by uh, the the uh, older generations and uh, for in some cases the younger generations actually espouse and strive to match up with that stereotype live up to that stereotype the figure of the hard working refugee which is acknowledged uh, both in films and in the social in the common social lore common way of saying Third generation refugees actually grew up with the memories like I was saying that has been inherited from the uh, two generations that preceded the memories that are partly in, 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 in large ways idealized, uh, part of which has components of imagination in it and 
uh, also some of it being extremely negative and those ne negative aspects of memory are not uh, much talked about uh, or, or talked about with a lot of pain and would not be people want to discuss them too much. So, this process of uh, passing on bequeathing and inheriting memories, they are likely to distort the, an individual's understanding of the past of history, uh, unless uh, a well rounded divergent uh, you know uh, understanding is shaped, uh, different views are incorporated and they are presented they are available in parallel. So, all the versions are available. So, the child is able to understand that if this was true, there was also uh, a, a counter to this reality. Uh, and, and so, that is how uh, uh, the, the notions uh, you know developed about the past are not lopsided. Uh, Anjali Gerara uh, says that partition in the west as in partition in the east was not uniform experience uh, shared by all those who crossed the border from the west, but varied, uh, um, but, but varied according to uh, gender, class, caste, ethnicity, re region, education, profession, mode of transport and place of uh, settlement. So, Gerenoi analyzes the ways in which partition altered notions of one's, uh, how partition altered one's notions of home, belonging and uh, community. It is very interesting that uh, memories cannot uh, be objective. So, they are, they are subjective in the first place and they are subjectively transmitted uh, and that is how uh, they are retained uh, as a, a displaced meaning from the original uh, and, and that is how partition uh, lingers, partition uh, stays back and, and uh, comes back. Uh, with a newer significance in um, the post partition uh, decades. Uh, uh, with every new generation, newer meanings uh, come up. Uh, these meanings uh, actually uh, are, are happen as a result of these meanings are formed as a result of one's uh, you know knowledge inherited from the family, which further interacts with the uh, contemporaneous uh, realities. Right. So, for the Punjabi refugees in Delhi, the convergence between the convergence between the social arenas of the family and the nation reveals the corresponding characteristics of strategic uh, ignorance. So, there were many cases in refugee families where family members wanted or needed to forget uh, uh, or, um, or you know or produce ignorance. Ignorance on the state level is not something similar to ignorance on the uh, you know family level. So, there are two aspects on the one hand the Indian state was also refraining from talking too much about the bloody aspects of partition and then uh, the families had uh, their uh, uh, disgraceful experiences that uh, that that were being hushed up. So, uh, these silences at different levels were also there existed gaps and disjunctures uh, within uh, you know silences uh, uh, being enforced at different levels. These disjunctures expose as Arjun Apadurai uh, states uh, the set of norms whose sole purpose is to regulate the inherent debatability of the past in the present. So, how the family as a unit or the an individual personally uh, 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 you know uh, muddies the past or or uh, or let us say evade some part some parts some aspects of the past and how such evasion such uh, deletion happens at uh, the state level may not uh, you know uh, follow the same processes but uh, and, and it is very interesting to note how these two uh, uh, you know practices or these uh, two practices have some overlaps and then some differences right. So, uh, inherited memories uh, seek to fill uh, by talking to children and grandchildren of partition refugees and understanding how memory is passed down. So, what is retained or lost and how it is owned and shared by subsequent generations right. Firdaus Azim uh, states that these are the memories of third generation descendants of uh, migrants or refugees who have no direct experience of life, 
before the 1947 partition. So, they have never been to the other side of the border to their original homes. The story they weave is complex with many strands where differences pertain not only to religion, but also to ethnicity and language. So, uh, partition narratives in refugee families illuminate uh, two unresolved modalities. There is a tension between ignorance and forgetting. One part is uh, how the especially the older generations want to forget some parts of the memory and then the other uh, part of the debate is how the subsequent generations do not have enough material to forget. They are basically ignorant. They do not uh, remember, they do not even remember to be able to uh, disremember or they do not even uh, learn about the past to be able to unlearn them, uh, to, to, to be able to unlearn it. So, uh, forgetting is the power of erasure, obliterating and revising memories, ignorance is the power of unaware, unawareness. In fact, ignorance is indeed a power because uh, uh, the baggage of a memory, uh, if, it, if it does not shape one in a favorable and in a desirable way, uh, can be cumbersome, it can be unfavorable and, and uh, it, it can be overpowering on one's identity, it can crush one's identity. To be ignorant about certain aspects, not knowing about certain aspects of one's past can be potentially empowering. It contributes to a strategic space, uh, you know, unhamper, unhampered by memory. Ignorance is not really hampered uh, by a very, uh, you know, overbearing uh, and demanding, uh, you know, uh, remembrance from the past. So, both forgetting and ignorance are used in different ways at the level of the family and at the larger level of the state. There are some things that we do not know and some things that we do not want to, uh, you know, remember. The familial silence around the shared links between Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims, for example, have been translated into a structural ignorance. So, when we have uh, the stories about the enemies and friends, that is how they are defined. Uh, even the, the first generation refugees sometimes uh, uh, play ignorant because they want to forget about the shared past. After all that they have witnessed, uh, many of them have lost their faith in intercommunal, you know, harmony and even the possibility pos that the different communities uh, uh, could live together, had lived together in fact, uh, with some degree of dignity. Uh, so, it is a kind of generational uh, forgetting that is, uh, that is imposed and passed on and naturalized and that is how we understand the enemy and the friend. Uh, so, in fact, uh, seen from India's uh, point of view, Indians point of view, the creation of Pakistan uh, is, is popularly, popularly understood as the political result of yielding to the Muslims interests, right. And uh, so, partition is read as a loss of the unity, the territorial unity and uh, the imagination of a unified nation, right. For the second generation Bengali immigrants, uh, interviews reveal that nostalgia is there, nostalgic pining and yet there is a kind of emotional detachment to where the idea of or, or the ima imagination of the homeland, the homeland never seen is to a large extent uh, sublimated and diluted. Uh, the dialects, the different dialects from East Bengal are hardly and in fact, never uh, used um, at least by the urban youths from the immigrant families. And uh, this, these families uh, located in the urban areas in Calcutta are not sticklers of uh, East Bengali customs and traditions. Uh, the lives have become more hybridized uh, uh, and, uh, and the roots for the third generation, um, you know, and the identification is with Calcutta or Kolkata. Their social setting has transformed into, you know, cultural sites. So, uh, in other words, uh, the, their cultural sites that uh, the first generation actually carried in, inside their mind, inside uh, themselves, in their memories, 
have uh, diluted the cultural sites are imagined in the immediate uh, uh, locality where they live the the immediate social ses setting where where they inhabit so uh, younger members uh, uh, from immigrant families uh, we see they grew up they grew up in housings many of these were uh, colony housings uh, in other cases uh, too the refugee houses uh, would be modeled after the original home back in east bengal and pakistan uh, east pakistan so uh, for the third generations interestingly in the absence of the real referent the real home that they have never seen and probably would never see they understand it east bengaliness east bengali lifestyle through a simulated existence in calcutta or in other parts of india where uh, they are born where they are born and brought up so uh, that's how uh, you know the cultural site ha ha which they uh, you know their uh, earlier generation carried inside their head when they uh, you know uh, when they uh, moved from East Bengal, from East Pakistan, uh, has been transcribed, has been transposed, transposed to the immediate social setting where uh, the third generation is living now. So that is their home. Uh, I mean, that that's what they understand. The East Bengaliness that they get from their immediate family now, the nuclear family, is the East Bengaliness that they know, and that's already. Uh, not the original that is already something besides the original uh, it is hybridized. Now Kolkata itself has undergone a lot of changes through the post partition decades and the meaning of the city has shifted through its interface with new ways of life, new ways of uh, being, new cultural practices, social practices and even with the changed name the city itself can be uh, you know seen as a palimpsest with layers of meanings you know written one on top of the other. For the first generation uh, you know cultural sites would comprise landed property, rivers, joint family system uh, something that they had experienced uh, back uh, in, in their ancestral home on the other side of the border. However, for the second generation where such uh, you know family systems such extended family systems uh, are not possible the cultural site has shifted to the country of Im immigration and so they actually extract or, or they derive meanings from the immediate uh, uh, you know surroundings. Uh, Dipanka Sinha um, notes that by the turn of the millennium the phenomenon of insider outsider who is the insider or the native and who is the outsider or the refugee or immigrant has actually watered down to a, a large extent and there has been considerable mainstreaming of the colony population. So, so these differences uh, are uh, highly, highly theoretical so to say in, in, every day, in everyday practices they uh, uh, so much as almost do not exist they uh, almost do not exist. Now talking about diaspora, uh, diasporic communities uh, take uh, many forms and they engage in a substantial range of activities and yet there is a tendency among the scholars, uh, so among the socialists and uh, you know even in the nationalist depictions to, to uh, understand uh, diasporic communities as a locus for uh, studying the transnational practices only right uh, diasporas in in reality are multifaceted social organizations they are interwoven in the contemporary context in their immediate contexts uh, with legacies of uh, colonialism and uh, there are many interesting emerging trends towards uh, cultural economic political and social globalization Diaspora is something in a state of flux, it is never a constant. Diaspora should not be uh, you know conceived only as a through the traditional notion of persecuted uh, victims who were forced to flee their homeland. However, on the other hand the enduring image of diasporian communities remain bound not only to the nation or not only to the notion of uh, migration, but rather uh, to the notion of forced displacement. So, dimension of victimage is naturally ascribed uh, with uh, or ascribed to the diaspora uh, whereas diaspora actually has more 
uh, to their existence than only the history of victimization. Independence and partition of India uh, fundamentally changed how members from the Indian diaspora community in Africa identified and defined themselves through focusing on the experiences of Indians in Eastern and South Africa. So, independence first of all caused them to move away from India as a source of a political identity. Uh, they started seeing themselves as a distinct community defined by their immediate and unique context uh, as you know bred by the adopted country, bred by the uh, or, or the new context as, as uh, posed by the host uh, country. Uh, secondly, the partition of India required Indians in Africa to redefine the notions of territorial belonging because uh, it was now a country uh, fundamentally different from the one they had left. So, maybe uh, the India that, that they had uh, you know left uh, when they ventured uh, to, to travel abroad it was now part of uh, eastern or uh, western Pakistan, it was not even India. So, in some cases the religious divisions uh, uh, worsened as a result of partition and, and the, the the intercommunal uh, you know strife say back in India uh, had repercussions uh, in the diaspora, it caused the Indians in Africa to identify themselves more strongly along religious lines. So, different circumstances uh, come up in Kenya, in Mauritius in, and in South Africa where uh, the Indian populations react differently to the question of independence and the British uh, in the, and the partitioning of the British India. So, uh, the diaspora shared a common pan Indian identity that was reinforced by a common uh, subordinate relationship with the British, right. Some of these writers such as Nagendranath Ganguly see the interests of Indians at home and abroad as something parallel and identical and so the demand support for the Indian diaspora, there is a demand for support from the Indian diaspora. Uh, from the British Indian government. So, so the diaspora is geographically away and yet uh, they are not really uh, entirely detached from uh, the, the uh, political uh, schemations uh, and the political happenings uh, back in India. They are somehow an extended uh, part of it, uh, they, they somehow echo the issues happening in India. We see that uh, the violent clash between Hindus and Muslims um, uh, that marked uh, that, that happened at the time of partition affected the identity of the diaspora along religious lines. Earlier the history of Hindu and Muslim immigrants in uh, Africa was closely knit. So, they led a kind of syncretic uh, you know existence as indentured immigrants uh, in Africa and they found themselves living and working side by side often in very difficult conditions. So, uh, according to Ganguly it was necessary for Indians to think of themselves beyond their community uh, especially in, in, uh, in their overseas experience they were uh, they, they thought it as important to compromise and adapt their habits or their you know uh, conventional communal differences in order to be able to live in their new uh, situations in the host land in African countries. Even intermarriages between castes that were uh, forbidden in India would occur uh, in diaspora. Uh, for Indians that were born abroad differences of caste and religion had less cultural significance that the one, than the ones uh, living in the home country. However, we see that uh, uh, divisions between uh, uh, the in, in the light of partition, in the light of uh, the, the, the violences happening back in the homeland, there are divisions between Hindus and Muslims in Kenya and South Africa, uh, you know, cropping up uh, or, or uh, becoming visible uh, from time to time, uh, even uh, occurring later in the 20th century. In this regard, Chandrasekhar Bhatt uh, notes that internal relationships in Indian communities abroad were often defined by the external conditions of their adopted countries. Uh, about uh, the Indian immigrants in Africa prior to partition, but describes that Indian identity supersedes all other bases of identity to enter onto ethnic competition often leading to 
conflict with other immigrant groups. So, among the diaspora in the diasporian community rather than Hindu Muslim uh, conventionally traditionally it has been uh, as the Indians as a unified identity against other you know uh, diasporian communities. But uh, the repercussions happening back in the homeland uh, would leave their traces uh, in the diaspora too. The differences would start showing the difference that differences that were otherwise not there. So, uh, so I would like to conclude uh, the lecture today by seeing that partition is central to the modern identity of the Indian subcontinent as uh, you know comparable with ho the holocaust uh, among the uh, Jews uh, in, in, in or um, something that uh, defines the modern uh, Germans identity. Asha Jalal notes, uh, Asha Jalal calls partition as the central historical event in 20th century uh, South Asia, a defining moment that is neither a beginning uh, nor an end, partition continues to influence how the peoples and states of post colonial South Asia envisage their past, present and future. And uh, British uh, scholar Yasmin Khan studies partition uh, you know as a standing testament to the follies of the empire which ruptures community evolution, distorts historical trajectories and forces violent state formation from societies that would that would otherwise have taken different and unknown paths. So, with this I am going to conclude today's lecture, thank you.